This is CBC Nova Scotia News. Tonight, Justice Minister apologizes. Brad Johns is saying sorry after questioning whether domestic violence is an epidemic. Disability support denied. Some autistic children are missing out on as much as $800 a month because of IQ requirements. And hanging up her hooks, this 99-year-old reflects on the friendships made through decades of rug hooking. Clear skies tonight, a chilly start to Friday, but recovering nicely under lots of sunshine. Your full forecast is coming up. Good evening. Nova Scotians are marking a somber anniversary today. It was four years ago that a gunman started a deadly rampage that would claim 22 lives. Today was supposed to be a time for quiet reflection and remembrance, but mixed messages from the government threw everything into turmoil and forced the Justice Minister to apologize. Blair Rhodes explains. We'll always remember the shock, the sorrow, and most importantly, the lives lost. It started off pretty much like you'd expect for a day like this. Flags were at half-mast and people paused for a moment of silence. But things veered off course when reporters asked Justice Minister Brad Johns whether he agreed with the assertion of the Mass Casualty Commission that intimate partner violence is an epidemic. No, I don't, because I think that uh, an epidemic, is, you're seeing it everywhere all the time. I don't think that's the case. I think, uh, you know... Personally, I think that this was an issue and is an issue, but, uh, you know, ap academic or thank you. No, I don't. Less than 10 minutes after Johns made those comments, Premier Houston was back on the video screen from Pictou County to rebut his justice minister. I heard the comments earlier from the Minister of Justice and Education. I want to be very clear about this government's position on domestic violence. The Minister of Justice will be issuing an apology. But more than anything, I want to know, I want the families to know that we will be moving forward with the recommendations in a way that honors them. They are foremost in our thoughts. Houston said he'd be talking to Johns, but he refused to answer questions about what that conversation might be like. But the opposition leader said they know how that conversation should go. Considering this is the anniversary of the Porter Peak uh, massacre, his comments are pretty disgusting. Apology isn't enough. I think if we have a Minister of Justice that doesn't think that domestic violence and gender-based violence is a major concern in this province, he should resign or be removed from that post. I think given uh, Mr. John's comments uh, today on the anniversary of Porta Pic, um, it is abundantly clear that he needs to resign from the post of Minister of Justice and Attorney General. By late this afternoon, Johns did issue an apology, which read in part, the pervasiveness of domestic violence and the harm it causes in our communities is not something that should ever be minimized, and I am truly sorry that my words did so. This government, my department, and I agree that domestic violence is an epidemic. Blair Rhodes, CBC News, Halifax. Anita Stewart of the Anaganish Women's Resource Centre and Sexual Assault Services Association says she is outraged by Brad John's comments. The comments made by Mr. John's, I believe, came from, I just have to believe they came from a place of being ill-informed and misguided. Um, I certainly would invite the Honourable Brad John's to come and visit our Women's Centre here in Antigonish, and we would be more than willing to provide him with enough statistics, education and knowledge that would allow him to come to the realization that domestic violence is absolutely at an epi epidemic level here in Nova Scotia. I'll talk to Anita Stewart about the Minister's controversial comments and about the efforts to reduce domestic violence in Nova Scotia. That is our Newsmaker interview just after 6.30. The Nova Scotia Teachers Union and the province have reached an agreement in principle. Details have not been released, but Premier Tim Houston says the deal addresses teachers' concerns around such things as pay and classroom conditions. News of the agreement comes after conciliation talks began with the NSTU on Monday. Talks started after the union received an overwhelming strike mandate from 98% of members who voted. Despite opening their doors less than a year ago, the new schools in West Bedford are due to exceed capacity by September. 
The Halifax Regional Centre for Education has announced it is installing two modular classroom structures at West Bedford School and West Bedford High School. The two schools are located on the same site, and although they aren't currently over capacity, parents say overcrowding is already an issue. They're disappointed and say modulars are not the solution. I think that's that's where the disappointment is that, you know, it took so long to get the school in our community and we were all looking forward to a community school. And uh, it's a massive school with so many kids in the school and it doesn't feel like a community school. Do you understand? Like the, it's just that's sort of what it feels like. It just was like delayed, delayed, delayed. Then we're opening it and now it's over at capacity and now we are band-aiding it with more modulars. The Halifax Regional Centre for Education says no area of HRM is growing faster than West Bedford. Last year, the province announced that four new schools would be built in the municipality. Today, Education Minister Becky Druin said the Public Works Department is in the process of acquiring land, but she says the province is not yet able to announce where the four new schools will be. Parents and advocates of children with autism say they should not be missing out on disability support from the province. Some families are being denied financial aid based on IQ levels, and as Selena Alders reports, they argue it's a discriminatory practice. That's so cute. And you, and you say and action if you're a star recording. Right. You hear that, Dave? You have to say action. I will, yeah. Okay. Twelve-year-old Rowan Squires loves making movies on her iPad, watching cartoons, and being in the sun. Oh, this sunshine is so important, and, and do you like... Summer, what's your favorite season? I like the autumn, the fall. Oh. Huh, well that's weird. <laughs> Rowan is autistic and needs help 24 seven with things like feeding, going to the bathroom and cleaning herself. But her family has been denied funding that would help her because her IQ is too high. Rowan's mother applied for the Direct Family Support for Children program four times and was denied. It offers between $100 and $800 per month, depending on income and family size. It's meant to help cover costs like respite, therapies, and medications. But in order to qualify, the province's policy says that the child must have a significant physical disability or an IQ below 70. I feel like it needs to be known that this is impeding on human rights now. You're discriminating against a family because of an IQ situation when we clearly need the help. And I know we're not the only people. Doug Ralph's 15-year-old stepdaughter, Chloe, was also denied because her IQ was above 70. Kids with autism have so much potential. They are some of the brightest kids. Um, they, they add so much to society. And so many of them are not given the chance to thrive, to get what they need to be the people they, they could be. And it's such a missed opportunity. Autism Nova Scotia says the IQ threshold for children to qualify for funding is outdated and one of the organization's top concerns. And in the autism community, only 35% of people who have a diagnosis of autism fall within that co-occurring autism and intellectual disability umbrella, which means that you have a large number of families who um, fall outside of this policy and therefore fall outside the support. Rowan... Um, is probably the most amazing, special uh, human being I've ever had the pleasure of knowing, and I feel really proud to have her as my, my sole child. But being a full-time caregiver takes its toll. Mason Squires said she'd use the money to help hire someone to care for Rowan, just so she can get a break. Like I said, to be able to just go and have dinner or go to a movie with my husband, we're big movie buffs, but we haven't been on a date in 13 years. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, we go out individually. No one from the Department of Community Services would do an interview with me, but they said they are looking at ways to replace the IQ part of the policy. They also added that last year the policy was updated so that families who do qualify can get more funding. All right, and finished. Selena Alders, CBC News, Halifax. A black Halifax man has taken his allegation of being racially profiled by staff patrolling the McDonald Bridge to a Human Rights Board of Inquiry. 
Ross Gray told the inquiry he did nothing wrong when he was accused of riding his bicycle in the pedestrian lane in July of 2021. And while Halifax Harbor Bridges apologized soon after agreeing a mistake was made, he says that's not sufficient. Gray, who is 60, says he wants accountability because what happened still affects him. Well, I'm always looking over my shoulder. I very rarely trust anybody now. If I go to a restaurant, which I, not too much that I do, I, I got my back to the wall all the time. My cameras, my phones and my cameras ready to go. If, uh, if somebody approaches me, that's not warranted. I'm just more heightened sense now because of what happened. I don't go over a bridge anymore on my bike. I stopped doing that in 2021. A lawyer for Halifax Harbor Bridges says the mistake that was made had nothing to do with racial profiling. Ron McLeod says it was a genuine error that was quickly acknowledged by Br bridge patrol officers he says were polite at all times. The inquiry chair reserved a decision and now has six months to issue a written decision. All right, Ryan, what a day out there. We'll take another one of those. Thank you very I know. much. Sunshine, some double digits. Yeah, fantastic. And another nice one shaping up for Friday as well. Temperatures are going to be lovely. The winds are going to be a little bit lighter as well, which will make the day even better. Now, uh, high temperatures today, anywhere from 5 to 8 degrees across Cape Breton. Uh, you can see 6 to 10 to 12 to 13, even 14 degrees down and through the southwest of the province. Uh, the clear skies that are setting up, uh, that is going to be notable for tonight as this area of high pressure heads uh, sits right overhead. The wind's becoming lighter. It is going to be a chilly night tonight, no question, but we'll recover with all that sunshine tomorrow. Here's our next weather maker rolling through the Great Lakes right now. That will take its time moving in thanks to this area of high pressure basically setting up a wall and we'll be watching that coming in as we move into tomorrow and there it is uh, again the high cloud cover starting to work its way in but the rain will hold off until Saturday and we'll watch the timeline here there's Saturday morning couple of showers possible in through the west in the morning but for the most part this is going to be the afternoon when we start to see some of those showers then some steadier periods of rain those are going to push in, yeah, as we turn the page into the Sunday, uh, or at least Saturday night time period. By Sunday morning, note the back edge of this, starting to move away from Cape Breton. It's basically Anaganish, Guysboro, and Cape Breton that have the chance of some hangover rain Sunday morning, and then that will clear out, and we are looking at a lovely Sunday shaping up. So the weekend, a 50-50 split. I think we'll take it this time of year. We'll uh, talk about it in detail with those temperatures and your seven-day coming up in a few minutes. Tom and Amy. It doesn't sound good. too bad at all. Okay, <laughs> thanks so much, Ryan. Thanks, Ryan. Thank you. Well, tickets for Cape Breton Eagles games at Centre 200 went on sale this morning after the team moved on to the third round of the playoffs. And those tickets did not last long. It's the first time the team got this far since 2007. Kyle Moore reports. It's been more than a decade since lineups were this long for Cape Breton Eagles tickets. Fans showed up early Thursday before they went on sale at 11 a.m. hoping to get in line and their hands on what's become the hottest ticket in town. Yeah, I was outside uh, around 9.30. The Eagles are heading to the semifinals for the first time in 17 years after defeating Shikutami last night 8-5 and sweeping the series. It's only the third time in franchise history the team has made round three in the playoffs. Fans have been waiting a long time for this moment, but didn't mind waiting a little longer in line today. Oh, it's not too bad. It's moving slowly but surely. Yeah. Hoping to get a ticket? I'm hoping to get four. In a little more than an hour, the lineups were gone, and tickets are now sold out for games three, four, and six here at Centre 200. At the airport, the team arrived home this afternoon to a friendly welcome from fans with horns and signs. Everyone now seems to be jumping on the Cape Breton Eagles bandwagon. I watched the t the game last night on TV, and we had like a whole party with everybody. We love the Eagles; they're awesome. <laughs> Before touching down today, the players say they couldn't help but notice how fast ticket sales were going back home. It was all the talk on the plane ride to Sydney. A few of the guys were following along there. I think 
like it's almost sold out in 20 minutes or so. So uh, no, that's that's great, and uh, you know I'm, I'm sure uh, it'll be a good time here for uh, game three and four. The team has won 17 of the last 18 games and are playing some of their best hockey of the year. Fans are not only getting behind the team, but say this is a special group, and the players agree. We're super close off the ice. Like uh, everybody loves each other. And we're already like block shot, like Shorty blocking shots with his face, Biggs with his back. Those are leaders, right? And so everybody's just buying in and following each other's lead. The Eagles are now only four wins away from a place they've never been before, a trip to the league final. Kyle Moore, CBC News, Sydney. The Minister of Community Services says 30 pallet shelters coming to Sydney will be located at Pine Tree Park. Brendan McGuire says the province will not be changing the village's location a second time. It's not a potential site. It is, it is a go-ahead. And I, I do want to thank uh, CBRM, the mayor, and uh, their staff, and, and uh, New Dawn. Uh, we worked closely with them uh, from the beginning to locate uh, a spot. This, is, this land is privately owned. It's, it's owned by New Dawn. And... It suits the needs and it's close to uh, New Dawn and the services that are provided. New Dawn Enterprises is partnering with the Ally Center to bring the shelters to CBRM. They were originally planned for Whitney Pier, but the province decided to re-examine the location after safety concerns were raised at a public meeting in February. Major zoning changes that would increase density in Halifax have cleared their first hurdle being approved by the city's Heritage Committee. The changes fall under the $80 million housing accelerator fund. They would allow four units on a lot within the service boundary and up to eight units within the urban core. There's also more height on transit routes and approvals of dozens of specific developments, but staff scrapped the allowance for nine-story buildings around post-secondary schools on the peninsula. Frank Palermo is planning professor at Dalhousie University. I think that's probably a, a good idea. It was a pretty, you know, uh, it was a proposal that really wasn't very well thought out, I didn't think, to begin with. And I think they had a lot of opposition to it, you know, from a lot of very vocal people in the community. And, and that part of it seems, you know, reasonable to me to have kind of relented on that. All of these changes could allow for 200,000 new housing units. Council will debate the changes next week and a public hearing will be set before a final decision. The city of Kamloops has installed artwork to honour Royal Canadian Air Force Captain Jennifer Casey nearly four years after she died in a crash. A monument has been installed in her honour at a new park near the Kamloops Airport. It features a plane made up of a mosaic of maple leaves and branches. At the time of the crash, Casey and her crew were on Operation Inspiration, a cross-Canada flyby mission to recognize everybody doing their part during the pandemic. The park is set to open later this year. Casey, who was from Nova Scotia, was a former journalist and was working as a public affairs officer with the Snowbirds. Shirley Carey has been an avid rug hooker for the past uh, 40 years or so, but as she nears her 100th birthday, she's decided it's time to hang up her hooks. The CBC's Jane Sponigal visited Carey at her home in Avonport to learn more about her storied time as a rug hooker. Have a look. If you work at it really, hard, you can hook a piece the size of your hand in a day. <laughs> so it takes a long time. Shirley Carey is my name. I go up in Wolfville. And then I became involved with rug hooking in 1980. It's quite important that you belong to the Guild, which, as I said, is centered in Halifax. And they operate a school once a year. This was something new to us, and I thought it would be nice to have some hooked mats, and that I could probably do a hooked mat in a week, little knowing <laughs> what it would involve. But when I got there, I found it overwhelming. To, it was difficult to pull the loops up through this burlap. 
And I get one up, pull a second one up, the first one would come out. How long did it take you to make that first rug? Oh, it was all the next summer off and on, you know, when you would work at it, and into the next fall. How did you feel when you finished that first piece? Ready to do more. And wherever you went, you'd see something, a picture or somebody's painting that you would like to uh, do a copy of. You always had to ask permission. There's one piece and it's over there. I think it's a, it's a rug that has a pumpkin on it. Your mom would say, now go downstairs and pick a piece that you'd like to have. Well, is the pumpkin up for grabs? No, no, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to keep it because I wanted the pumpkin so badly. <laughs> I enjoy them more than I do flowers. <laughs> it's quite an art then. It was, there really is before you even get started, yeah. Mm -hmm. You're an artist then too, thinking about the colors and things. Not really, I just know that I like distinctive colors, bright colors, yeah. Don't like the dull shades. So these uh, are both one to grandchildren? Oh yes. Okay. Yeah. Yep. The oldest. And so how does it feel to share your work with others because it's on display some of your pieces are on display right now in, in Wuffle, and it's, mm. some pieces have been on display before. Well, I do feel humble because there are others who does work much better than I do. You've recently stopped rug cooking. Well, I miss it greatly, and I miss all the other ladies very much, yeah, because we've always enjoyed getting together, yeah. So that's a big part of it then, too. Oh, yes, and everybody is very open with their work and very free with all their information. Since I have lived alone, it's company. <laughs> yeah, and we can always call on another person to help us out, give advice. They're all wonderful girls, as we call each other. <laughs> I think she is an artist. I know. Pretty great community, too. I know. She doesn't, like the, doesn't like the dull colors. No, me neither. You can tell. No. <laughs> that was awesome. Way to go, Shirley. All right. First quick break on the way. Stay with us. Yes, we have a lot more to come on CBC Nova Scotia News. Ottawa is now eyeing abandoned, derelict, and rundown federal properties to help address Canada's housing crisis. And the Quebec government has announced that the two new mini hospitals being operated by the private sector will provide services exclusively for elderly people. Pretty nice looking day in Lower Woods Harbour. Ryan is back next with your Friday forecast. We'll see you in a few minutes.
All right, saw it first one this season, for me at least, uh, top down on the convertible. It uh, was a top oh, down kind oh, of day, beautiful. wasn't it? I saw somebody with shorts and t-shirt on okay. today. I thought that was a little early, but for both of them probably. Well, probably right? a little bit. Take I it support it though. <laughs> yeah, do it when you Full can. Full steam ahead. For sure, yes. <laughs> it's at the very least, I don't, you know, maybe not all top down, but mm -hmm. certainly window. Yeah, crack know, the window Partially down. <laughs> We're getting there. If not all the way down, depending on your speed. Yes, yeah. uh, definitely beautiful. And the mm. sun just makes such a difference. Mm. Oh, say it, it sure over does. Over. Uh, but it's so true. Have a look at our beautiful shot here. Yes. Anybody recognize that spot? Of course, burnt coat head. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Uh, of course, one of those spots in the province uh, that uh, so many people uh, flock to to see those uh, epic tides. Mostly sunny skies there, eight degrees right now, and just a terrific scene. And you can see across the province, it's uh, generally uh, those mid single digits in the northeast, a little cooler there, obviously, in Shadow Camp, just at two, Port Hawkesbury at two as well. Uh, and again, at four, Picto at five at the Caribou Point Station. And you can see 10, 12 degrees uh, down through the south and west, and uh, at least in parts of the south and west. And we are looking at Western Head and Yarmouth, a little bit cooler, Westport at eight degrees. And note those winds, you can see, yeah, still a little on the, little on the breezy side across Cape Breton, sustained in the 15 to 30, even 37, that last check at uh, Grand Etang. 33 in Halifax as well. This is where the winds have been persistent today. Noticeably persistent, no doubt. Uh, Sydney uh, has been seeing some gusts upwards of 50, even 60 kilometers per hour along parts of the coast of Cape Breton today. Bit of cloud cover in the mix, uh, but overall, as we said, just a glorious day. So nice. There's the low that we've been talking about the last couple of days. And yes, that has been bringing heavy, wet snow, 10 centimeters down in Gander. And yes, uh, the winds gusting 80 to 100 kilometers per hour along parts of the coast of Newfoundland. So that is the storm that is creating the wind for us and keeping temperatures cool. Area of high pressure sliding overhead tonight means the winds will ease tonight into tomorrow. And as we said, a pretty chilly night setting up. We'll show you that in just a sec. This is our next system moving into the Great Lakes. Look at the warmer air uh, climbing up here. 30 in Nashville, 22 at Virginia Beach, just 13 in Toronto. That warm air, unfortunately, won't really be tapping into our uh, neck of the woods. But uh, yeah, look behind the system. Minus Fort Regina as uh, temperature is certainly much cooler on the back side of that low. Tonight will be cool uh, for this time of year, no doubt. Uh, temperatures will drop to the to the freezing mark. We'll drop into the minus two and minus three range in some uh, spots in low-lying areas. The winds will be north. I did put light on here because they'll back off to around 10 to 15 kilometers per hour. Uh, we'll see those northerly winds for Cape Breton, though, continuing 20 to 30, gusting 50, even 60 kilometers per hour along the coast this evening. But all that sunshine uh, will make way, obviously, for the clear skies tonight. And then all the sunshine comes back tomorrow as the sun rises. Bit of cloud cover in the mix, but this is a mostly sunny day on tap for tomorrow. Uh, for the island tomorrow, we're going to be seeing those northerly winds uh, easing into the afternoon, becoming a little more northeasterly. Temperatures near 4 in onshore winds to as warm as 10 and 11 degrees in and around the Bredora Lake region. As we look into the uh, Northumberland Eastern Shore, 6, 8 degrees will be uh, likely into the double digits by the time we get to Sher uh, Sherbrooke and then uh, back across into the HRM, as you'll see in a moment. Uh, 10, 12 degrees uh, in through Amherst, down through Parsboro in the Cobbequid Bay area. Temperatures climbing into the teens for the valley, and we'll be looking at temperatures as warm as 13, 14 in places like Kedgie. Bit of a light onshore wind here will keep temperatures a bit cooler right along the south shore 14 in Bridgewater and yeah temperatures in the 13 to 14 de degree range for much of the Halifax area but again a bit cooler right along parts of the coast. Saturday 8 to 10 is about all we'll get with the increasing clouds and the rain moving in. Uh, Cape Breton may see a little bit of sun in the morning on Saturday. Uh, not much though, and there comes that rain. Looking like it's arriving a little bit later. Over the last 24 hours, the models have been trending slower with this system. Uh, certainly look, turning damp into the afternoon, but it looks like Saturday morning will be dry for many of us. And then that line will come through. And by the time we get to Sunday morning, uh, on the doorstep of exiting Cape Breton and Sunday is looking like a pleasant day indeed. Not a big 
water uh, rainmaker, uh, we're looking at generally 10 to 20 millimeters across uh, the province. So yeah, a, a solid, uh, nice soaking just to dampen things up, uh, easing any uh, forest fire risk and, uh, and brush fire, grass fire risk. And then we're again clearing on Sunday. Uh, great day for outside and uh, looking at Monday, Tuesday, looking pretty nice hey, as well. Tom lots a. of yellow on the board mm -hmm. there, huh? Yeah. Very nice. Okay, thanks Thank you, so much, Ryan. Ryan. Thank you. Well, up next, I'll talk with Anita Stewart of the Sexual Assault Services Association in Anaganish about the controversial comments about domestic violence from the Justice Minister today. That is our Newsmaker interview. Stay with us. You're watching CBC Nova Scotia News. On the fourth anniversary of the Nova Scotia mass shooting, Nova Scotia Justice Minister Brad Johns said he doesn't agree that domestic violence is an epidemic. He said he felt there were bigger issues around things like guns and drugs. He has since apologized. Anita Stewart is Executive Director of the Anaganish Women's Resource Center and Sexual Assault Services Association. So uh, I'm just curious, Ms. Stewart, how you feel about the Justice Minister's comments today? I have to say I was a bit disheartened to say the least. Um, 
the comments made by Mr. Johns, I believe, came from, I just have to believe they came from a place of being ill-informed and misguided. Um, I certainly would invite the Honourable Barad Johns to come and visit our Women's Centre here in Antigonish, and we would be more than willing to provide him with enough statistics, education, and knowledge that would allow him to come to the realization that domestic violence is absolutely at an epi epidemic level here in Nova Scotia. What do his comments tell you about the government's approach, if anything, to domestic violence in this province? Um, I, I don't want to maybe speculate on Mr. Johns, uh, if he's speaking for himself or the government. Um, I know that there were many recommendations made by the MCC report. Um, I'm hoping that uh, those will, you know, will proceed and um, hopefully we will see all of them implemented. Do you agree with the calls, um, the removal of the Justice Minister? I really cannot, uh, I, I honestly can't believe that someone in his place and in his position um, as a Justice Minister would make those comments. Um, as I said, I just believe they are uh, misguided and, and ignorant and um, ill-informed as well. Brad Jones was being asked about the speed with which the Mass Casualty Commission's recommendations are being implemented. How do you feel about how those implementations are going? Well, I think in order for all the recommendations to roll out, certain things do need to be in place. Um, in order to reduce domestic violence, uh, certain things have to happen. Uh, one of those things is that women need to have access to safe and affordable housing, which uh, currently is not the case. Um, the gender pay sorry, the gender pay gap needs to be addressed to allow women to be able to leave domestic violence situations, so they're not stuck living with the perpetrator. Uh, stable long-term funding for women's centers across Nova Scotia and other organizations that serve women, um, that is of the utmost importance um, in order to continue the work that we do, which is extremely important, and also to retain uh, valued staff and educated and knowledgeable staff. Um, we need to do more prevent preventative work, which, which was a recommendation of the mass casualty. How do we do preventative work? We do it in ways that bring prevention programs to schools. We need to teach our youth that um, domestic violence is, is something that they may face in their lives. We need to teach them that what it looks like and what it what it may look like for them. It doesn't look the same for everybody. Um, domestic violence comes in many different forms, not just physical abuse. It could be psychological abuse, sexual abuse, economic abuse, and so on and so forth. Um, we need to implement programming at a very young age so that our youth that are coming through the school system will be very well educated on this topic, unfortunately. Um, I know here at our center, we run a program, it's called Healthy Relationships for Youth. And we've been doing that for almost 20 years. Now I do have to uh, give credit and say thank you to the status of women of Nova Scotia and the Public Health Agency of Canada. This year, just last month, we found out that we were going to receive enough funding to provide province-wide training for all students across Nova Scotia through our Healthy Relationships Program. And that's just one program that's out there, but it teaches youth what a healthy relationship mm -hmm. looks like. It does not look like hitting. It does not look like course of control and all the things that we all know about. So the, just um, so on that point, I, the, the really government... feel strongly that we need to start young and teach our youth. Uh, this funding that we will receive will sustain us for about five years and going forward we hope to look for more funding. It's of the utmost importance. And the government did talk about funding today. They say they have it increased funding for domestic violence and victim services units. So you are seeing some of the benefits of that? We will be seeing the benefits of that, absolutely. Um, starting in September, uh, we will be rolling out a province-wide program, as I mentioned, the Healthy Relationships for Youth. So we, we are one of the lucky centres, and as I said, that was made possible through the status of women, but also the Public Health Agency of Canada. Now, we need to get back to our, our core funding and see an increase in that, so I'm hoping that that will also be implemented. Um, and like I said, that will allow us to do our work um, 
that is so important. So many um, organizations that are community-based see women coming through their doors. We are here to help them, support them, and not just pass them a phone number. We're with them all along the way for the whole entire journey. All right, Anita Stewart, uh, we'll have to leave it there. Appreciate your thoughts on this. Thank you so much. Thank you, Tom. Coming up, cleanup efforts are underway in Dubai after parts of the country flooded following the heaviest rainfall on record. Welcome back. Abandoned, derelict, or rundown federal properties. That's what the government is now eyeing to help address Canada's housing crisis. It's part of this week's budget that includes a multi-billion dollar plan to build more homes. Ashley Burke has more on the plan and the challenges. Three decades ago, these former military homes were decommissioned, and years later, the land turned into a residential neighborhood. That work is still ongoing, and now the government wants to add another 500 homes. We want to create an opportunity to leverage public lands across levels of government. It's just one example. The budget has similar plans for more than a dozen unneeded Defence Department buildings. We're very excited to talk about that. Ottawa's mayor says he's encouraged, but the details will matter. 
we'd have to go site by site and understand what each of the properties is like, what buildings are there, do they have heritage designations and other restrictions, do they, uh, are there other challenges on the site? The government's also eyeing derelict Canada Post buildings like this one in Vancouver. It's among six being assessed for possible development. How many government buildings do we have? Um, if they convert them, um, does that really address the issue? I'd like them to build a lot more housing and not have this three, five year window before people can get in. We cannot afford housing here already, it's expensive. In all, the government says it hopes to have 250,000 new homes built on its public property by 2031. But leasing out cheap, unused federal office buildings and land would come with some strings attached. If we're leveraging public land, we're going to insist on certain affordability criteria. This housing expert says that could be a deterrent for developers. Developers don't like a whole bunch of rules and regulations that they have to comply with, and especially if it reduces their potential profit margin. So the more of those requirements that, that are put on by the government, the less likely they are to be encouraged to go ahead and do it. He also says the process to build even more homes on federal land like this could take three to four years, all at a time when the Liberals are up against the election clock. Ashley Burke, CBC News, Ottawa. The cleanup is underway in the United Arab Emirates after it was hit by the heaviest rainfall ever recorded in the desert nation. The UAE on the Arabian Peninsula typically sees little rainfall with its arid climate, but more than a year's worth fell on a single day on Tuesday. The downpour flooded streets and damaged buildings and other infrastructure. It also halted operations at Dubai's airport, the world's busiest for international travel. Officials expect the airport to be back operating at full capacity in 24 hours. Healthcare advocates in Ontario are sounding the alarm about private clinics performing cataract surgery. They say billing by some of those clinics is taking advantage of patients. The CBC's Christine Birak has the story. Diagnostic test, $300 per eye. Kate Armstrong wants her money back. Legally blind in one eye and barely seeing out of the other in 2022, she says a surgeon at a Toronto hospital told her if she went to his private for-profit clinic, she could get her cataract surgery faster. So she went and signed contracts she could barely see. How do you ask questions when you can't read? Armstrong signed off on $1,200 in diagnostic and measurement tests, over $3,000 for her first cataract surgery and nearly $3,500 for the second, money the province would have paid. $8,000 is not what I had then, and I had to borrow it, and I had to cash in order as peace. Healthcare advocates say a growing number of Ontarians are in the same boat. All medically needed cataract surgery is covered. Every hospital can handle medically needed cataract surgeries. And if you're being told anything else in a private clinic, that is not the truth. A single cataract surgery takes roughly seven minutes. Currently in Ontario, the longest average wait time is three and a half months. A CBC News investigation found the Ontario government pays public hospitals about $500 per surgery. It pays private clinics up to $1,300 for the same work, so patients should not be charged. Ontario's health minister insists few patients are using their credit cards. And the numbers show it is a very, very small group that have to have that investigation, ultimately get reimbursed when appropriate, and corrective action is taken. The most recent Health Canada numbers show for-profit clinics charge Canadians nearly $80 million for medically necessary services. People are blindly, excuse the pun, being ripped off. Armstrong won't likely be reimbursed because she signed the contracts. She says the trust she once placed in doctors is gone. Christine Birak, CBC News, Toronto. Quebec is pushing ahead with plans to bit with two new mini hospitals. Both will be operated by the private sector, one in Montreal, the other in Quebec City. But now the government says they'll provide services exclusively to the elderly. Sharon Yonan-Reynolds has more. 
With long wait times in Quebec emergency rooms, the CAQ says the many hospitals will offer relief. But now the two centers will focus only on senior care. We have heard the establishments, we have heard the specialists, the experts, they are telling us that there is a need. He says long wait times and harsh conditions in ERs can be especially detrimental to seniors. The centers will offer observation beds for short-term stays, even overnight. Minor emergencies could be treated, but surgeries won't be performed. Patients would be referred by an ER, 811 or an ambulance service. This expert says while similar projects might have worked for children, seniors are a different story. So they have multiple chronic conditions, including dementia, they can be very frail, have mobility impairment. And it's really hard based on any kind of questionnaire over the phone to really know if that person requires significant care. The services will be covered by RAMQ at no cost to patients. It'll be staffed by private and public health care sector workers, but will be built and managed by the private sector, a sore spot for some opposition parties. Do you need a concept of private mini hospitals to take care of the elderly? Absolutely not. And the private sector is more expensive, it's a fact, and not necessarily more efficient than the public sector. This expert says there's truth to that claim. It's not necessarily a good idea. There's there's no evidence that the private sector is more efficient there because healthcare is not a simple good. It's a different t- thing than contracting out, for example, cafeterias in hospitals. The CAQ hopes to deliver the two facilities by 2025. Sharon Yonan Reynolds, CBC News, Montreal. For 36 years, it gazed across Edmonton's downtown and people coming and going gazed back. For the last 60 years, it's languished in obscurity. But now a piece of the city's history is returning to public view. The CBC's Emily Fitzpatrick has that story. And here we have the window. Okay, so it doesn't look like much now, but this bronze window is all that remains of a bygone era. This window has been around since 1928, so it's almost 100 years old, 96 years old. It's a piece of Edmonton's history. It's witnessed many comings and goings. It's witnessed prime ministers coming to Edmonton, the royal tour of 1939 with King George and Queen Elizabeth. It's huge. It's bronze. When was the last time you ever saw a bronze window? And it was like over top the front doors for the train station. So everyone saw it when you entered the train station, when you left the station. It was there prominent. Before the window found its way to the Alberta Railway Museum, it was here, on the second story of the Canadian National Railway Station in Edmonton. The station opened in 1928 and was a hub for travelers and visitors in the downtown core. It was demolished in 1964 to make way for the Edmonton CN Tower. And the window is all that remains of the building. This is it. I mean, maybe there's some bricks. Uh, It had lots of Tyndall stone. It had some marble. But, I mean, to me, that's just kind of entrails of dead buildings. Um, There's really nothing left. It's just this window. But for the past two decades, it's been in an Edmonton backyard until a museum got a call that the owner wanted to donate it. The window weighs about 500 pounds, so it took a crane and many hands to make it happen. But eventually, it was freed. When the opportunity came up to say this window into history, this way to look into the past, it was too good to pass up. The museum is still working on a plan for how to best display the window once they fix it up. But whatever they decide, this piece of history is on track to be around for another 100 years. Emily Fitzpatrick, CBC News, Edmonton. Canada's main stock index gained just over 50 points today with help from strength in utilities and base metals. Here's a look at how the markets did as we head to break.
For news you can trust, we have the latest on what's happening in your community and a weather forecast you can rely on no matter where you are in Atlantic Canada. I'm Amy Smith. And I'm Ryan Snodden. Join us for Atlantic tonight. Right after the National. Yes, I would say the sun put everybody in a good mood mm. again today. Just and, beautiful. And Friday is looking good too. Yeah. yeah, it is. And not just the, you know, humans that are in a good mood with the sun, <laughs> the plants as well. Uh, have a look at our viewer picture of the day. And this one we're going to zoom in uh, to Gates Mountain, of course, there in, uh, in the valley. And uh, this picture, I love oh, this. Yeah, full I bloom. haven't seen one of those full yet. On. So the best part about this is Sarah uh, snapped this uh, a few days ago, April the 15th, but she checked her camera and documents when the first daffodil blooms in her garden. Mm -hmm. And 28, eight, uh, 2019, 2020, it was around the 25th or 26th okay. of April. Okay. Uh, but the last couple of years, it's been right around the 15th okay. or the 16th or the 17th. Inching so, forward, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. interesting uh, stuff there. And thanks to Sarah for sharing. Uh, so yeah, the daffodil is going to love this again for tomorrow. Uh, temperatures into the teens from Halifax through the valley down towards the south shore. A little cooler in those onshore winds for Yarmouth, but if you're away from the water, uh, we'll be into that range there as well. Cooling as we work our way to the north and east thanks to those northerly winds. Saturday is damp, especially into the afternoon and evening, uh, but not a washout by any stretch of the imagination. And we are looking at that sun coming back in for Sunday as we clear the mm. skies from west to east. Bring it back. Yes, exactly. All right, Time Magazine has just put out its list of the 100 most influential people of 2024. And a number of Canadians made the list. Michael J. Fox is being recognized for his work in Parkinson's research and, of course, his acting work as well. A very touching tribute was written by fellow Canadian Ryan Reynolds, complimenting his uniquely electric wit and self-aware charm. Nova Scotia's Elliot Page is also on the list. He's being honored for his acting, trans rights activist work, and sharing his story in his book, Page Boy. Last but not least, and a bit closer to home for us, is a former CBC journalist Connie Walker. Her investigative work has earned her a Pulitzer and a Peabody Prize. Connie says she's proud of this latest honor. Congratulations, Congratulations to all. That yeah. is it for us tonight. Thank you so much for watching. We'll see you next time. Good night. Good night.